And now we have a special session coming up. We have Johanna Koljonen, who's going to take the stage. Um, you all hopefully know her as the analyst and author of the Nostradamus Report. Um, this year's report will be launching to Friday. So you're going to get a little sneak preview of some of the themes of it. She is honestly one of the smartest people I've ever met, so please listen carefully to Johanna. Please. Thank you. Um, it's lovely and exciting to be here again. Uh, we're launching the Nostradamus Report on Friday, and this is going to be a sneak preview. Basically, I'm going to walk you through one of the, uh, one of the chapters. I'm pressing the green one. Yes. Um, the Nostradamus Report is an, is an uh, annual uh, analysis of the near future of the screen industries. We're looking at the three to five year scope. Uh, we're not, in fact, predicting the future so much as describing what is happening right now. And at the heart of our strategy is speaking to a lot of people in strategic positions in the industry. And the decisions that they make today are already in practice shaping, of course, what everything will look like three to five years from now. You would know since you're all the, those kinds of people yourself. Uh, this means we have a pretty good success rate, and in fact, the, you, can, you can find uh, the last, well, all of our reports are uh, on the website, uh, where you will also be able to download this year's report on Friday for free. It's gjöteborgfilmfestival.se slash Nostradamus. And I think that the last two or three years of reports will still be quite useful to you, because we are looking at slightly different topics every year. Uh, this year is five chapters as well, but I'm going to talk to you uh, in particular about what is happening in the streaming landscape. And I think in some ways, every, everything, all of this is already familiar to you, of course, uh, but what, what we're trying to do is to zoom out a little bit and just get an overview uh, of what is happening, because we all tend to get so bogged down in our own projects, of course, and our own deadlines and our own slates, um, but also at the sort of immediate threats and uh, high-profile conflicts at this sort of situation. So three to five years from now, we believe that the streaming landscape, this whole change that we are now currently in, will have kind of found its form. Maybe not its final form in Pokemon terms, but at least we're going to know a little bit about what it looks like. Uh, of course, already most of what we think of still as television is digital and streaming, and increasingly that, uh, that's going to continue. The technologies are changing, uh, but what we know is that on-demand de on is clearly going to dominate. That's already happening, and linear... Uh, which will also be streaming, will be focused on, on things that are live or live or live. Now, most analysts agree that about five services are going to dominate the global market. When they say global market, typically we mean sort of the, the, the north and the west, the global, <coughs> global north. Uh, and most consumers, most households will have a direct relationship to one to five of those global uh, services. Now, if you read uh, the trade papers in English, they're always going to assume that all of those uh, dominant services in every market will be uh, American. And there is a lot of reason to believe that this will in fact be the case. Everybody's expecting Google, Netflix, um, Apple, Amazon and Disney probably to come out on top. But it isn't quite certain. And of course, one big area of uncertainty is how important are the local services going to be. So if the sort of market of the global north is split up between these five services, whichever five they're going to be. Is there going to be a sort of, sort of local, the local majors? Are we going to have one or two uh, additional services in each uh, region or each language group? Via Play, I think, would say, yes, we will, who will also take a, a big chunk of the market. Could they possibly even be in the top five in their local markets? This we still don't know. But probably there's going to be a sort of a very small middle section. And a lot of the big broadcast brands of today, a lot of the big cable brands, everybody is trying, of course, to transform themselves into a streaming service of some kind. Some of them will succeed. Most of them will probably not succeed and disappear or become niche services. And a niche service in this sense is perhaps up to, let's say, 10% of a market uh, would be possible. And the consumer, the household, will have a combination uh, of these services. And there is a financial space uh, for this as well. 
because basically everything we're paying for cable today will, will be willing, uh, at the very least, to pay for the subscription services as well. And subscription is not the only model. Now, I said Google, Netflix, Apple, Amazon and Disney, but it might be other names that come out in the end. Uh, Facebook, for instance, as we know, has an audience, even if they don't have the content, so that could happen. On the other hand, Facebook, Facebook could be hit in the next few years very hard by regulation because of how they've been handling our data and be wiped off the map. That can also happen. Um, and of course, this year we're going to see at least three new services, or within the next year, not just Disney+, Plus, uh, but also AT&T Time Warner, who are building uh, an SVOD offering around the Warner Library and HBO. Uh, in the Nordics, HBO has been an, a real player for a long time, but now they're also moving into this global space. And of course, we also just heard a few weeks ago about the Comcast uh, NBC Universal service that is going to be ad-financed or ad-supported. They have slightly different models. Um, and Comcast is the biggest cable operator in the United States, and they're going to offer this service for free for all of their existing customers. We believe that the Comcast uh, NBC Universal streaming service will reach 52 million homes within the first year. So these are clearly players that have a real chance to make an impact in the global marketplace as well. And then I'm not even counting the Chinese companies that, of course, can give uh, the Americans a run for their money in many markets as well. So, so one thing that we need to think about when we, when we consider these changes is, is the, when we talk about the industry or the interests of the industry, this is slightly problematic because there is no such thing as the industry. If you're a producer, your relationship to, uh, to Netflix, for instance, is going to be quite different than if you are a Nordic broadcaster, for instance, or a public service company. But probably the long-term goals of everyone in this room, I think, are broadly similar. And that probably goes for everyone in this room who works for one of the Globals as well. I, I, it's probably great for the world and for democracy and for culture if we have a relatively diverse marketplace where stories, storytellers of many kinds can tell stories, also niche uh, content of a high quality to the audiences. There is no place for shit content or filler content anymore. As you all know, that's gone. Like, if you're making that, just drop those projects. Nobody will ever see them. Um, <clears throat> another thing that's changing, uh, of course, is that we have this new EU regulation that says that we're going to have 30% local content on the services. And I think, I'm sure, like, I'm not necessarily a great believer in, in these sort of blunt regulatory tools, but now we have this, and I love that they're putting money in the local production uh, economy, because as we're discussing in the report as well, the Americans are benefiting enormously from a lot of infrastructure and education that's provided in Europe uh, by, by these public funds. However, <laughs> uh, if you are a local, again, broadcaster or a local service, you could argue that this is incredibly short-sighted, that, that, that making more local content available on the global services is actually going to drive the audiences there or, or deepen the audience's relationship to them uh, even more. Uh, so, so we have to be able, I think, we have, as we talk as an industry, we have to be able to talk to each other and think, keep in mind whether there are long-term goals and short-term goals, even with, for ourselves, that might sometimes be in conflict, and to try and think a little bit more strategically about where to place our content. Then, of course, if you get the sweet deal, you know, with an American service, you're always going to get it, and your talent would kill you if you don't. Um, but at the same time, we have to try and be a little bit strategic, I think, as well. So Netflix's subscription model already familiarized us with this idea that an individual piece of original content doesn't need uh, to be profitable, um, that you can have these sort of loss leaders. But I think we've all thought about Netflix as sort of, yeah, yeah, like they're, they're throwing a lot of money at content, but they're a lot in debt. And they are, in fact, very much in debt. The business press reports that at the end of 2018, uh, the debt uh, that Netflix is dragging is $10.36 billion, which is up like $7 billion in two years or something like that. So that is a lot of money. The business press is also reporting that they can probably absolutely handle this. Netflix is going to come out just fine unless they like spectacularly fuck up in the next few years, which I'm sure they won't. Um, of course, uh, somebody else might do something that the, that the consumers love even more, but let's just assume that Netflix is going to be around <coughs> for a bit. So what's happening, of course, right now is that everybody's racing, uh, we're in this arms race, right, with content investment. Everybody's throwing money at content because everybody wants to be in that top five. And if you are in that top five, at the end of a few years, you're going to be fine. And if you're not, 
you're going to have, have lost a lot of money, and, some, and we're going to probably see quite a lot, another wave of sort of mergers and con consolidation to save the companies that have lost uh, in this race. And of course, even Netflix could be sold, because as I'm going to get to, there are certainly players who are big enough to buy them. Um, ultimately, though, Netflix is on a subscription model. They have one product, which is that subscription. So at some point, they are going to have to, to balance their spending with their earnings. Right now, no, they're in an expansion phase. Of course, everybody understands the business logic, but at some point, the, the numbers need to make sense. If you are uh, a content unit, console, for instance, a US studio that is consolidated with a, a, a telco or an internet service provider or both, then the products you're selling are not just the content, then it could be mobile phone services, for instance. And then already that, that profitability calculation is starting to look quite different. And what we're seeing now, of course, is that, that when the super platforms are getting into the game, that this same logic is changing even more. I stole this picture from Variety, but there are a billion uh, versions of it on the internet. You can also just go on uh, Wikipedia and look at the relative sizes of the companies. Uh, so the right triangle right there is Disney, but we still have 21st Century Fox here on the left. So you have to think that the Disney triangle is, quite, is going to be uh, about double the size uh, in March. But over, over there on the right, you have Facebook uh, Alphabet, which is Google and Amazon and Apple. So uh, Alphabet, Apple, Amazon, Facebook and Alibaba and Tencent as well are all in the world's top 10 companies by market capitalization. This is not media companies. Obviously, they're also the biggest media companies. These are in the top 10 of the world's biggest companies in any category. All the companies, right? Uh, Google and Facebook between them take about a quarter of the world's advertising revenue. All of the world's advertising revenue. Uh, Apple and Amazon are also among the top 20 most profitable uh, companies in the world. And I think Disney is already uh, also in the top 100 or something like that. Now, all of these companies, their business models are supported by content business. For instance, making TV drama, otherwise they wouldn't. This is a good deal for them. But they are not relying on this content, and that changes the playing field for them entirely. Um, and that is different because their product is not the subscription, which is the Netflix product, right? Um, so Amazon's Prime Video, which has like 19 shows so far, like it's not a lot. They don't haven't made all that many uh, originals. Um, there are films, of course, as well. Uh, there, there were some internal documents leaked last year uh, that Reuters was reporting on, where they said that between 2014 and early 2017, a quarter of their prime memberships on the Amazon service came were driven by the, by, by the video originals. This is actually a really good deal. Again, of course, we don't have the exact numbers, but we believe that right now, Amazon is making about $9 billion every year in membership fees alone. That's before they've sold you anything, right? That's just the membership that you have to make it easier to buy everything in your life from it, from them. And if you live in the Nordic countries, you shop relatively rarely on Amazon. If you live in New York City, you probably buy your groceries from there and they're going to be delivered to your home in like two hours because you're a prime member as well, because you really like transparent. Um, And if we take a company like Disney, Disney obviously is not a tech, tech company in the traditional sense, uh, but it has for like a very long uh, time, sorry, I'm just need, trying to keep a little uh, time at the look at the watch here. Um, yes, Disney has been much more than a media company since the very beginning, and uh, merchandising and licensing and parks and resorts have carried their business. In fact, the, the theme parks kept them alive during that whole period, you remember, when they couldn't make a good movie to save their lives. This was like in the 80s, I think. Um, now, of course, they don't have any problem dominating the box office and making a lot of content that people actually want to see. And the acquisitions that they made of Pixar, which is like an IP, original IP machine, of Star Wars and of the Marvel universes, have not just given them a sort of market domination, a very profitable business on the film side, uh, it also grew their audience of people who are in love with these brands. Disney doesn't sell TV shows and films. Disney sells mythologies and backpacks, right? And they sell these intergenerational stories that people love so much that they will literally tattoo their brands on their bodies. 
and make sure that their children are going to love these brands just as much as they do. These are like religious relationships. So when Disney Plus this year is going to bring these brands into people's homes and have that direct consumer relationship with them every month, of course you can measure the, the value of this in subscriptions, but in some other ways you, cannot, you, you can't measure it in subscriptions because it doesn't matter if it's profitable or not because it's all about the relationship to this. And it's funny actually because Disney has this founder figure, this Steve Jobs character, who had a dream that they have been working very sort of systematically on for almost 100 years. Uh, and I, I think, I mean, it's very interesting if you hang out with people at Disney, especially Imagineers, of course, they still talk about Walt. Yeah, Walt says this, Walt says this. Walt has been dead for a while, but Walt is like really present in the Disney universe. They have a mission. They're not just a company. This is not just about shareholders, even though they make a good buck, right? Film by film, episode by episode, companies like this cannot be outspent. Any talent that they want, they will work with. Uh, and this doesn't necessarily mean that they will automatically succeed. And not all of these companies are necessarily even want to uh, or, or be interested in challenging uh, Netflix. Um, I think Apple is an interesting example. We know they've put maybe $5 billion in original content uh, so far. You would assume that if a company is uh, comfortable putting $5 billion in content, they would have some kind of plan of how to make people watch it. Uh, we don't know this plan. And it's not entirely certain that they even know the plan, because that's how much money they have. Um, there is one popular rumor that says that, that they might make their original content uh, exclusive to users of iOS products uh, and free. There's another path where that says maybe they were going to have a subscription service um, and it's going to be on some smart TVs. They've already said that maybe people, even people who are Android users, aka on Google phones, might be able to watch their content, perhaps. Two very different paths. Uh, we don't know which it's going to be. And this vagueness might be a marketing choice, or this vagueness might be that they, as an organization, have no, not decided uh, what they're going to be in the future. And this is all a little bit complicated by the fact that Apple, of course, has the iTunes store, Google has the Play Store, Amazon is a marketplace as well. They also sell other people's content, and they make a lot of money selling other people's content. And if we're moving in a trend towards exclusivity, it might actually be a better deal for them. Uh, then they might need to, to be there with their originals and, and other types of services. But right now, they're making quite a lot of money uh, by being marketplaces. And even more importantly, uh, when it comes to SVOD services, they are SVOD aggregators, as it's called. So they're third-party distributors of premium video subscriptions. So this uh, is Amazon channels, I think. You can go on their platforms, decide which channels you want in your bundle, and then pay through their service where, where Amazon or uh, Google uh, or Apple or Roku, if you use that, is going to take a cut. And what, right now, what we're seeing is that the SVOD services are growing through these aggregators. Like, this is where you get new subscribers if you're not a very, very high top-level brand like Netflix or, or uh, Disney. Everybody else is getting their subscribers through this. And it might still be a better deal for these companies to, uh, to get a cut of everybody else's money rather than go exclusively on their own. Uh, in particular, because we are also using it, of course, on their hardware, the Apple TV, the Google Chromecast, the Fire TV the Roku stick. These are becoming now the television access point of, a, of the households, and the young households are going to go fully here. They're never going to have a cable subscription. This is the set-top box now, and this is the cable uh, subscription now. Um, yeah. It's also interesting that right now, at least, it seems that if, you're, if I'm watching SVOD content through Amazon channels, the the SVOD service actually doesn't get the data, so Amazon gets to keep my viewership data and a slice of the money, which is a really good deal for them, and I wouldn't uh, agree to it if I was a service. How am I doing on time? Oh, I don't know when I started. I feel like I was five minutes late. Okay, I'm close to the end. Um, so if you're an aggregator uh, like they are, then of course providing original service, uh, original content that is exclusive to, to that platform is a really good sales case for making that your television. I'm going to have the Apple TV, I'm not going to have the Chromecast in, in sort of uh, ecosystem because I like their original content better than theirs or, uh, or whatever. Um, 
But this is the complexity of this is one of the reasons, I think, why these mega companies have moved a little bit slowly on their content plans. Uh, they might be right now deciding which business are they going to be in down the line, and what relationship to all of the other content contenders does that long-term plan require? Uh, Apple is probably planning to be in the hardware business. Do we believe in that, though? Like, how long can you be a dominant hardware provider in the sort of computer and computing space? Are they coming to an end of the run and needing now to transform to a content company? Maybe, maybe. Uh, but there are some questions, some bigger questions here uh, that, are, that are much more important to these companies and to their shareholders than, like, let's say, the price of an SVOD subscription. So they're trying to decide what relationships there are other businesses required to the rest of the marketplace, and in what way the original content will best support the place where they're making their real money. Um, yeah. So if everybody goes direct to consumer, a big problem is, of course, that as everybody who's on a subscription model will want to have their content exclusively. So today we're still in this ecosystem, uh, and a lot of the historical uh, agreements, of course, are still continuing, where the studios are licensing their content to different kinds of, of, of uh, broadcasters, for instance. Uh, and there are still some traces of that. For instance, Warner Media, even though they are launching their own service, they let Netflix have friends for another year uh, for 80 million. Uh, US dollars, as you've all probably read. This is poss possibly a terrible decision, because Friends, a year from now, when it's been on Netflix for a year, is not as valuable for them uh, as, it, uh, as it would have been if they hadn't made this choice. But they also have put in their contract the possibility that they can pull Friends from Netflix and put it on their own service if they want to. Also, they're saying, or they can share the license, which is very interesting, I, uh, and also possibly a terrible business decision, right? Um, but. If you think about it, if all of the majors stop selling their content or licensing their content because they want it exclusive on their own services, and this goes for film as well, for TV drama, then the whole marketplace is going to change. Now, we don't know that it's going to happen. That is one very likely path. And I think if you're making content in a, in a language that is not English, uh, or in any context that is not one of these platforms, you're in a very, very interesting marketplace suddenly because everybody who used to buy or license that content are going to need to show something else, and it needs to be really good, and it's probably going to be made by you. So that's great. Um, yes. Um, so how do you compete uh, when the competition can always outrun you? How do you compete when you can always, always be outspent? How do you compete when everybody makes content of a very high quality? Uh, and the answer, of course, is only with relevance. Probably these platforms that are going for the broadest audiences are also having to go for broader content than they historically have. Um, that seems very likely. And that means that with the specificity, with the local relevance, uh, with the artistic vision, all of the things that have always been at the heart of strong storytelling, right? That's still going to matter, and that's still going to have an enormous uh, commercial power as well. When we speak about the importance of curation, which we do all the time in this industry, of course, what we mean is relevance, selecting for relevance. Relevance will power local language SVOD services, relevance will power public service media, niche and genre subscriptions, your local art house cinema, uh, and ultimately also the consumer-to-consumer -consumer distribution systems that we believe will also get a, a place in the market, for instance, for independent film. Uh, and finally, I'd just like to end on, on this picture, which I just grabbed off my, off my Facebook feed. So this is a share of a video from Reddit, uh, which has been upvoted a hell of a lot. And then it, the video here, which is just like a few minutes, that has like two and a half million views. And the, the Reddit video selection is, man wakes up after sleeping for three hours on stream uh, to find he has 200 viewers. So this man is somebody who was doing a Twitch stream. If you don't know what that is, shame on you, go do your homework. He was doing a Twitch stream, um, just, just chatting, uh, which, uh, Twitch stream, and he fell asleep in the middle of it, and the internet went bananas watching him for three hours. And on Twitch, of course, you can donate money. So he woke up after sleeping for three hours, and he looks over at the screen, and people are giving him like $35, $50. They're just donating, and they love him, and they're like, he's alive! They didn't think he was dead, but they just, they pretended to think he was dead. Um, and the thing is, 
so much of the young demographics, uh, younger demographics media use is things like this. So everything that I've just said is super important, but in one way, it's like all of the giants are doing things. In, that's still a sort of historical way of thinking of television. So even though we have to remember everything I said about the big services and super important, you also have to keep an eye on this. I was very surprised to learn this year that BitTorrent, if you remember BitTorrent, the, the historical enemy of everyone, uh, they are now a content uh, company that is targeting uh, male millennials. And they have like 100 million users on their platform because they're BitTorrent. <laughs> uh, and they can still really target advertising that is attached to specific content. That's a really good deal for certain kinds of advertisers. Uh, so all of that is happening as well while the giants are duking it out. If they mess it up, this is where the younger audiences are going to be uh, instead. So exciting times. Uh, come join us on Friday <laughs> for, uh, for more discussions, for instance, about public funding. Uh, and remember that you can download the report here on Friday for more details and numbers. Thank you very much.